11 Joy News Desk with me, Daniel Dazi. Let's take you now to the NDC's national headquarters where they are um, currently addressing the nation as they do weekly. Sami JP, who is national communications officer, is first of all taking us through the selection of Professor Nana Jeno Pokwajimang as running mate and you soon outdoor the campaign team for election 2020 for the NDC. And the impeccable track record of the running mate to the flag bearer of the NDC's Excellency John Dramani Mahama, Professor Nana Jane Fukuku Ajama. May I humbly ask at this stage that we all put our phones on silent and observe some order so that we can proceed. Let me indicate that this press conference, as always, is being streamed live on about 80 radio and television networks across the 16 regions of Ghana. In the greater Accra region, we are being streamed live on Pan-African TV, GH1 TV, Joy News Television, Asempa 94.7 FM, Power 97.9 FM, Class 91.3 FM, Accra 100.5 FM, and Ahoto 92.3 FM. On social media, we are live on at official NDC Ghana on Twitter, the NDC Communication Bureau page on Twitter and YouTube, Wazor TV on Facebook and YouTube, Graphic Online on Facebook, and Radio Gold on Facebook. In the voter region, we are live on Voter One Television, Seller Radio, Global FM, Swiss FM, Lucusi Radio, Della Radio, the Nyigba Radio, Shine FM, Holy FM, Jubilee Radio, and Kekeli Radio. In the Upper East region, we are live on Word FM, Pure FM, Zeps FM, and Source FM. In the Northeast region, we are live on Lom FM and Scap FM. In the Savannah region, we are live on Inkligi 103.7 FM. In the Northern region, we are live on Mind FM, Zara Radio, Amana FM, Kesmi FM, Radio Tamale, Radio Kitawala, Superlili FM, Simili Radio, Justice FM, and Diamond FM. We are live in the Ashanti region on Kumase FM, in the Bonahafo region on High Radio, and in the Central region, we are live on Coastal FM, Benya FM, Live FM, Sweet FM, Rich FM, Nice FM, and Obrumankuma FM. In the Eastern region, we are live on Okwau FM, Afram FM, and in the OT region, we are live on OT Radio, Buem FM, Gateway Radio, Nyewasi Radio, and KFM. As we proceed, I shall acknowledge other radio stations and media networks who are streaming this press conference live. So at this stage, I will start with our address on the appointment of Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman as running mate for the 2020 presidential elections. I mean, running mate for the flag bearer of the NDC, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen of the media. We have the honor to welcome you once again to the headquarters of the Great National Democratic Congress for the seat edition of our weekly press briefing. On Monday, 6 July 2020, the flag bearer and leader of the NDC, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, made history when he, upon consultations with and the unanimous approval of the Council of Elders and National Executive Council of the party, announced Professor Nana Jenupukwa Jeman as his running mate for the 2020 general elections. President Mahama and the National Democratic Congress, through the appointment of Professor Nana Jenupukwa Jeman as running mate, have demonstrated that we recognize the towering contribution of women to the development of this country and believe in their capacity to lead at the very top of our political leadership, the presidency. Indeed, this is a proud moment 
to be a member of the NDC, and for that matter, a Ghanaian. As for the first time in our fourth republic, one, please, is there any technical hitch? I, I, I can hear people complaining about sound. Okay. I will take the last paragraph again while the sound is being worked on. Indeed, this is a proud moment to be a member of the NDC, and for that matter, a Ghanaian. As for the first time in our fourth republic, one of the two most dominant political traditions has taken a bold step to shatter the glass ceiling and barrier to women empowerment in the highest office of the land. The appointment of Professor Nana Jane Upukwajiman, an astute scholar, an achiever, a well-accomplished educationalist, and a dedicated public servant, is a well-deserved choice that has built a new paradigm in Ghana's politics and provided a new sense of inspiration to the women of this country who have made several sacrifices for the development and progress of this country. Indeed, this decision is a, victory, is a victory for inclusive democracy and has further enhanced our democratic gains and credentials as a country. Distinguished friends from the media, Professor Nana Jane Upokwajeman is a God-fearing leader who exudes profound humility, honesty, competence, decency, and patriotism. She has unblemished integrity and can be trusted to restore the honor and dignity the office of the vice president has lost in the last three and a half years when elected. The overwhelming acclaim her appointment as running mate to President Mahama has received all across the world in the last 48 hours speaks volumes about the enviable niche she has cut for herself in both public and private life. Now, we would like to expose some blatant falsehoods that the New Patriotic Party is peddling against Professor Nana Jane Upukwajima. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, the NDC has noted the desperate fabrications being peddled by the New Patriotic Party about the sterling record of Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman as Minister of Education. Barely after the big announcement was made, the MPP's Director of Communications, Misa Yabwabian Samwa, who has become synonymous with panicky autopilot parody whenever the NDC addresses the nation on critical national issues, hurriedly put together a poorly assembled press conference in a vain attempt to denigrate the personality of the impeccable Professor Nana Jane Upukwajiman. Ordinarily, we would have ignored such blatant falsehood, which offer no value or importance for the development of this country. But for the sake of the unsuspecting public, some of whom may not be aware of the facts, and given the fact that these untruths have become the chorus of MPP communicators and apparatchiks, we would like to set the record straight as follows. Firstly, the claim that Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman canceled teacher trainee allowance is false. The decision to replace the teacher trainee allowance with student loan was a cabinet decision and not a ministerial decision. As you may be aware, the actual Mahama government to ensure equity and equality among tertiary students converted allowances for teacher trainees into student loans in order to abolish the dreaded quota system of admissions into colleges of education and increase enrollment and teacher opportunities for the youth of this country. As such, students who did not receive allowances got their loans under this policy. This was a decision President Mahama himself took responsibility for. This policy, ladies and gentlemen, which was not properly understood by many, was exploited by then-candidate Ekufuado 
and the MPP for cheap political capital and electoral gain with a promise that they will restore the allowances if elected. The sad reality today is that instead of the full restoration of the allowances as was promised by President Ekufuado and the MPP, teacher trainees are being served with a partial restoration of the allowances, which is being paid in a rather very erratic manner and for only eight months instead of 12 months, as was the case before the convention. In fact, our checks this morning show that the Akufuado government hasn't paid any allowances to teacher trainees since February 2020. And so the allowances they claim to have restored is currently in arrears for over four months. To add insult to injury, the Akufuado government has increased the school fees of teacher trainees and introduced feeding fees, which used to be free under the Mahama government. Worst of it all, is the abolishment of the automatic employment of teachers and the introduction of a needless licensure exams and an omnoxious mandatory national service policy for teacher trainee graduates by the Akufuado government. Currently, over 2,000 newly qualified trained teachers who have passed their licensure exams and undergone the one-year mandatory national service are still home without employment. Additionally, the non-performing Akufuado government has lowered enrollment into colleges of education, thereby constricting teaching opportunities for the youth. Sadly, infrastructural projects initiated in the then 38 public colleges of education have all stalled since President Akufuado assumed the reins of power. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, these are the reasons why President John Dramani Mahama has promised to maintain the payment of allowances to teacher trainees and abolish the needless licensure exams and mandatory national service policy for teacher trainee graduates, as well as restore the automatic employment of teacher trainee graduates when elected on 7 December 2020 by the grace of God. With Professor Nana as Vice President of the Republic, Teacher trainees can trust that the obnoxious licensure exams and the nuisance national service policy, which are convenient excuses for the Akufuado government's unwillingness and inability to employ teachers, will be cancelled and, more importantly, automatic recruitment of teacher trainee graduates restored. Secondly, the claim that Professor Nana Jane Opokwajeman introduced the three-month salary payment for newly recruited teachers is false. This policy was introduced by the finance ministry as part of GIFMIS reforms at the time to check the phenomenon of payroll fraud and ensure that newly recruited teachers, nurses, and doctors were paid their first three-month salary without any hindrance and subsequent salary paid upon validation. The temporary challenges the policy suffered at the beginning of its implementation were all resolved through the interventions of the Ministry of Finance under the XWAL NDC Mahama government. Thirdly, the claim that Professor Nana Jane Opokwajima cancelled book and research allowances for lecturers of tertiary institutions is yet another barefaced lie. Book and research allowances was never cancelled under the NDC Mahama administration when Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman was Minister of Education. As such, the MPP could not have restored something that was never taken away in the first place. Number four, concerning her plea for clemency for the Muntier trial, the good professor only signed the petition to mitigate the harsh sentences of the three convicts after they had served three weeks in prison and paid 10,000 each as fines for scandalizing the Supreme Court. Her decision to sign the petition to request for a reduced prison term for the convicts doesn't in any way mean that she endorsed the unfortunate comments as the MPP would have us believe. It must be noted 
that the woman we are talking about is a responsible and caring mother of three and a loving grandmother. Good mothers are known to forgive their children when they go wrong and after they are disciplined. Professor Nana Jane Upokwajama did not only support the punishment of the Muntia trial through due process, but she also identified with the repentance and remorse shown by the young men and sought lesser punishment for them. Her plea for lesser punishment for the Muntia trial was therefore not a vice, but an act of compassion and a virtue. It is worthy of note that that was not the first time the country, the country was witnessing such calls for lesser punishment for those who were found to have scandalized the court by the unguarded addresses. You may recall how lawyers for both the MPP and the NDC and several Ghanaians pleaded for clemency for the MPP Samir Wuku and the late Sir John, may his soul rest in perfect peace, when they were found to have scandalized the Supreme Court during the famous election petition case. Our friends in the MPP suggesting that all those who pleaded with the Supreme Court for clemency for Samia Wuku and Sir John, when they were cited for contempt by the Supreme Court, endorsed their reckless comments, that certainly cannot be the case. Friends from the media, interestingly, our MPP friends who are criticizing this act of compassion by the good professor are the very people who have shielded from prosecution and punishment the party thugs and hoodlums, the Delta forces, who stormed the KMA magistrate courts in broad daylight and attacked a pregnant judge and freed their colleagues who were in lawful custody. And this in itself says a lot about the character and credibility of the MPP. Prof has lived an honorable life full of integrity and decency and has earned for herself an unsoiled and unassailable reputation globally. Anyone who knows her knows that she will never endorse comments that incite harm against anybody. Again, the claim by the MPP that Professor Nana Jane Opokwajima failed to provide chalk to schools when she was education minister is palpable falsehood. This blatant untruth highlights how low the MPP will go in trying to denigrate our flag bearer's choice of running mate. At a time when the state of education in Ghana is such that our high school students are contracting COVID-19 due to the poorly thought through decision of the MPP to open secondary schools when we're recording a steep spike in positive cases, we should not be talking about propaganda that revolves around chalk. But for the records, under the tenure of Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman, more than five million pieces of chalk, comprising 4,994,328 boxes of white chalk and 180,000 boxes of colored chalk were provided to schools across the country, including the districts of the particular school where the said incident with the second lady Okay. Aside from this, Professor Nana Jane Upukwajima demonstrated unwavering commitment to the supply of teaching and learning materials during her tenure as education minister by providing 472,800 teacher textbooks, 12.8 million core textbooks, 2.5 million dictionaries among others, which significantly enhance the quality of the country's educational system. It is important at this stage to make the point that at no point in time, or at no time, under the tenure of Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman as education minister, did the country witness a situation where not a single textbook was supplied to school children and examination questions written by teachers on blackboards like we witnessed under the inept Ekufuado government last year. In fact, under her tenure as minister, the Mahama administration changed the test book ratio from four students sharing one test book to one student having three test books. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, 
The claim by some that Professor Nana Jane Opokwajiman is not fit for the vice presidency because she is not an economist is misconceived and laughable. It is instructive to note that the VIP position is not about economists, but the ability to lead and solve the hydra-headed problems confronting the nation. It should be clear, even to the uninitiated, that any person who is able to transform a public university, such as the University of Cape Coast, which has a faculty of law, school of economics, medical school, school of agriculture, among several other disciplines, and manage thousands of students and workers from diverse backgrounds, obviously has the competence and the versatility to effectively manage and discharge the roles and responsibilities of the office of VIP. It is worthy of note that this country has had vice presidents in the past who were not economists, yet chaired government's economic management team and produced excellent results. A classical example of this fact is His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, who despite not being an economist, served as VIP and chaired the economic management team under the NDC Mills administration from 2009 to 2012. It must be noted that it was within this period that Ghana achieved its best ever economic performance, i.e. highest economic growth rate of 14.4%, and the longest period of single digit inflation, just to mention a few. Also, the late Aliu Mahama, a civil engineer and contractor who became the VIP of President Kofor, did not have any economic background. Yet, he chaired the economic management team under the MPP Kofor administration, which produced the macroeconomic achievements the MPP has continuously boosted off. In any case, no government is bound by the VIP chaired EMT system, which is a mere convention and not a constitutional or legal imperative. It is for this reason that the actual NDC Mahama government constituted a body higher in authority than the EMT between the period of 2013 to 2017, called the Presidential Advisory Group on the Economy, PAGE. I will not be surprised if this PAGE system is adopted once again by the next NDC Mahama government. But even if, even if we decide to maintain the current VIP chaired EMT system, the versatile Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman has the competence to manage the economic management team with a team of knowledgeable economists and other personalities of the NDC to produce the positive economic transformation and prosperity Ghanaians are yearning for. As for the claim that she left behind debt at the Ghana Education Service when she was exiting as Minister of Education in 2017, the least said about it, the better. It is pathetic and laughable that this claim is coming from a group of people who have doubled Ghana's public debt in the last three and a half years with very little to show. But before I conclude, I will deal with some other backward and misogynistic comments that have been made by key functionaries of the New Patriotic Party against the choice of Professor Nana Jane Opukwajeman as running mate. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, apart from the sexist and baseless comments of Yabuabian Samwa, the similarly disgraceful comments by the majority leader in parliament that Professor Nana Jane Opokwajeman is not capable of being described as President of the Republic of Ghana is one of the most backward and misogynistic statements by a high personality who should know better. Comments such as these are reminiscent of other similarly shameful statements made by President Ekufuado when he suggested that Ghanaian women are not dynamic enough at a conference in Canada sometime last year. The worst part of this embarrassment was that he made the comments at an international women's event of all places where he was scolded and schooled 
almost immediately by a fellow panelist on stage. Such sexist comments have unfortunately, but predictably, come to define President Ekufuado and his party, the New Patriotic Party. What is even more unfortunate is the reckless abandon with which Yabuabian Samoa and Oseche Mensa Bonsu attacked Professor Nana Jenupuku Ajeman without any factual basis. It is quite jarring and so discouraging to people, especially women, to see how such a high-flying woman is attacked with such venom by politicians who could have been her students, and indeed, some were her students. It is very sad, ladies and gentlemen, to see a political party in the 21st century deeply rooted in 16th century primitive views about women. But to any woman listening and watching to us this morning, like Salamat from Peace FM, do not lose courage. Look at the accomplished role model, Professor Nana Jane Opukwajaman, and be encouraged and inspired to pursue your dreams. You can grow up to become anything you want to be, even the Vice President and the President of the Republic of Ghana. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the press, we again heard other female voices from the MPP talking about virtue. How rich in irony. We will resist the temptation to dignify those reckless comments with any response. And I know you know who we are referring to the character, the integrity, the competence, the proven track record, and the excellent leadership skills of the venerable Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman is unassailable. And no amount of lies can impeach her hard-won reputation or stop her from becoming the first female vice president of this country. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, aside these selling credentials I have outlined, Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman is an achiever. Is an achiever. A second, ladies and gentlemen. is an achiever who has distinguished herself in all the positions she has occupied. As you may be aware, Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman, after obtaining her bachelor's in degree in French, English, and a diploma in education from the University of Cape Coast, and after completing her doctoral studies at the York University in Canada, taught at the University of Cape Coast for 30 years, where she said, as a hall warden for Adeshe Hall, head of the Department of English, dean of faculty of us, and the founding dean of the School of Graduate Studies, before becoming the vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, thereby making history as the first female vice president of a public university in Ghana. She has produced groundbreaking research in the humanities, her world-class scholarship, made her become a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences and a life fellow of the Commonwealth of Learning. She has also published several academic and creative works and received honorary degrees from the University of West Indies, Grand Valley University, Western Salem University, and the University of Cape Coast. She again received a Global Leadership Award from the University of South Florida. Professor Nana Jane Upukwajaman was also Ghana's Minister of Education from 2013 to 2017 and served with distinction. Since she left office, she has continued to be a pillar in education by becoming the Chancellor 
of the Women's University in Africa based in Zimbabwe. She's also the president and board chair of the Forum of African Women Educationalists, with its headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. This is an important organization that she boosted by winning the Al Summit Prize for African Development in the field of education valued at $1 million. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, aside from these telling credentials, Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman has a proven track record of delivery in all the positions she has held. She transformed the University of Cape Coast when she was Vice Chancellor through her excellent leadership. She stimulated scholarship by investing in e-learning materials, provided a congenial atmosphere for students and staff by prioritizing their welfare, among others. She firmly rooted the School of Medical Sciences, established the law school, established effective ways to make the university financially sound, and massively expanded distance learning, and completed several infrastructural projects for the university. Also, as Minister of Education, between 2013 to 2017, she achieved many significant milestones, which include the construction of 123 community day senior high schools, 46 of which were completed by August 2016, and 77 at various stages of completion. The upgrade of colleges of education into tertiary institutions, the supervision of Ghana's overall best performing Western Nation Award by WAIEC for four consecutive years. The reduction of national average of teacher absenteeism from 27% to 7%. The establishment of special schools in seven out of the 38 colleges of education at the time. The introduction of progressively free SHS through targeted and sustained planning. The construction of 25 district education offices. The introduction of the Nouvelle BCE private candidates policy. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, in the teacher education fraternity alone, Professor Opoku Ajeman, as Minister for Education, increased trainee teachers' enrollment from 9,000 to 15,400 annually, added eight new colleges of education, and ensured all colleges of education benefited from get fund projects such as hostels, dining halls, teachers' flats, and what have you. She also ensured the procurement and distribution of 500 vehicles to educational institutions across the country, the completion of 1,129 classroom blocks, 73 teacher accommodation blocks, while rehabilitating 622 schools, the elimination of the obnoxious shift system in public busy schools is another achievement to her credit. Also, ladies and gentlemen, she ensured the abolishment of the quota system at the colleges of education, which led to the enrollment increasing from 9,000 to 15,400, thereby creating more teaching opportunities for the youth. She ensured the donation of 54,000 laptops to teachers and stock computer labs with 60,000 computers during her tenure to improve ICT education. She ensured the distribution of 787,485 free school uniforms to deprived districts across the country, the automatic employment of teacher trainee graduates, the securing of funds from the African Development Bank, which was utilized for the construction of 30 modern and well-equipped technical institutes across the country. She also ensured the conversion of polytechnics into technical universities and the increase of student loan beneficiaries from 13,833 in the 2012, 2013 academic year to 24,951 in the 2015, 2016 academic year. Again, she championed the introduction of the Student Loans Plus to cater for students who gain admission but face financial handicap in raising the initial time bound registration fees, and the distribution of over 40,000 free made in Ghana leather sandals for vulnerable students, among many others. Distinguished friends from the media, it is these attributes of competence, integrity, dignity, honesty, and a proven track record that Professor Nana Jane Upukwajeman 
brings to the NDC's presidential ticket for the 2020 elections. Her nomination as running mate by President Mahama was unanimously confirmed by the neck and council of elders of the party because we know that she is a safe pair of hands who will complement President John Dramani Mahama to execute his vision for the transformation of this country and the creation of prosperity for all when he is elected. The NDC is honored to have the venerable Professor Nana Jinobu Kwajeman as running mate to President Mahama. We revel in the positive local and international euphoria that has greeted her announcement as running mate and the renewed confidence in our politics it has brought about. We are absolutely convinced beyond a shred of doubt that our flag bearer by this spectacular choice has delivered a political masterstroke that will propel the NDC to a resounding victory on December 7th, 2020, and end the Akufuado reign of oppression, dishonesty, insensitivity, hopelessness, discrimination against women, corruption, and nepotism. The NDC is grateful to the vast majority of Ghanaians for the overwhelming and inspirational support this historic appointment has received. Let's work together and make history together. We shall prove the chauvinist wrong. Long live the NDC, long live women, long live Ghana. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. At this stage, we shall take the address of our Director of Elections, Honorable Elvis Efriye Ankara, on the ongoing voter registration exercise being conducted by the Jimensa led Electoral Commission. Thank you. presentation by Sami. I acknowledge all um, party executives here, all protocols observed. Um, this is a statement by the NDC on the ongoing voter registration exercise. Um, we welcome you all to this important press conference to share with you the NDC's observations from the ongoing voter registration exercise. The National Democratic Congress has been monitoring the ongoing voter registration exercise that commenced on Tuesday, the 30th of June 2020, and we wish to bring our preliminary observations to the attention of the Electoral Commission, the media, and the general public, as well as other stakeholders. These challenges, in our view, if not addressed, portend far-reaching implications for our electoral process and our democracy. Number one, complete disregard for COVID-19 protocols at the registration centers. And I'm sure many of you in the media will testify that it's been total chaos. Ghanaians will recall that one of the major concerns the National Democratic Congress, civil society organizations, medical practitioners, and health workers, lecturers, and ordinary Ghanaians raised about the compilation of the new voter register was the risk of exposing Ghanaians to the further spread of the novel coronavirus. As we all observed, the Supreme Court strangely backed the Electoral Commission and government to embark on the compilation of the new register. Our predictions were right. The Electoral Commission, upon all the assurances that they will ensure the observance of COVID-19 safety protocols, has lost total control over the process. From the beginning of the exercise, 
we have witnessed a complete disregard for COVID-19 safety protocols. While we observe that the wearing of face masks is being strictly enforced upon entry at the registration center, social distancing and washing of hands are not being observed. And indeed, the president himself went out to Abu Sokain, and you all saw the crowds of people that were following him. It remains mind-boggling how, in the face of a deadly pandemic, where Ghana's case count keeps skyrocketing by the day, President Akufuado and the Jane Mensah-led Electoral Commission will recklessly expose Ghanaians to the risk of COVID-19 infections. It is sad that even some EC officials did not have adequate protective equipment. Unfortunately, the EC appears to be blaming the general public for non-adherence to the safety protocols in, public, in its public statements on the ongoing registration process. After assuring the population that it is his responsibility to protect us, President Akufuado is now saying that we must take personal responsibility for our safety. At a time that President Akufuado has suspended cabinet meetings for his personal safety for fear of contracting the virus, he sees nothing wrong with Ghanaians massing up at various centers to register. Note that cabinet is made up of just about 19 ministers, and even that the president has suspended its meetings. And beyond that, we know that he has gone into what? Is it isolation, quarantine, or whichever it is, wherever he is, we don't know. So look at the president with all the resources available to him. He has decided to go on isolation for fear that one person within his detail has contracted the virus. What about the ordinary Ghanaians? Clearly, government has lost control over the spread of the virus. Our hospitals are getting full. Contact tracing has been abandoned, and there is a shortage of reagents and test kits. And you know that recently, over 230 medical doctors again called on the president, the government, and the EC to take a second look at what is happening because it's endangering the lives of people. We wish to state unequivocally that President Akufuado and the Jane Mensah-led Electoral Commission must take full responsibility for the further spread of the coronavirus through the ongoing mass registration exercise. We wish to use this opportunity to appeal to our supporters and the general public to proceed with the registration with caution and observe all the protocols. Let me also take this opportunity to commend all Ghanaians particularly our supporters for the massive interest that they have shown in this registration exercise in spite of all the attendant dangers. It shows that they are hungry and ready to whatever it takes to get this Akufuado government off our backs. The second issue is poor public education on registration centers and shadows. The apparent confusion that has characterized the registration at various centers can be attributed to a combination of factors. We have always maintained that the EC was not ready for the compilation of a new register, but they remain adamant and intransigent. The EC has adopted this piecemeal approach to the voter registration exercise simply because they do not have enough machines for the registration. We are reliably informed that the EC deployed less than 4,000 registration equipment to various centers across the country. It's a simple logic that if you order equipment in the midst of a deadly pandemic, where most factories have shut down, hello, at the back, I think you're having another conference, kindly, thank you. It's a simple logic that if you offer, that if you order equipment in the midst of a deadly pandemic, 
where most factories uh, have shut down or are not operating at their optimal capacity, this is what to expect. We warn the EC severally about the potential of not having the full complement of the equipment in good time for the mass registration exercise to no avail. Today, the chickens have come home to roost. We are reliably informed, just as we advise them, that the EC had to refurbish some of the old devices. In some registration centers, for instance, we have observed that some registrants are recording duplicates. This suggests that data is already in the system. This lends credence to the fact that old machines have been deployed for the exercise instead of the new machines that the EC budgeted for. The effect of the fewer machines and registration is that there is the panic reaction through massing up of prospective registrants who do not want to be disenfranchised, but are rather in a hurry to register and kick Akufuado and his government out come December 7th, 2020. Secondly, the EC has been inconsistent in following its own schedules for the voter registration. The schedules that were published to the general public have been changed on the ground, resulting in a lot of confusion which is adversely affecting the registration exercise. And mind you, it is not for fun that the schedule is published in a gazette. The gazette is a legal document that states the specific areas where the registration is going to take place. So you publish your schedule in a gazette, then subsequently you start varying it. People plan, I know many people who move from Accra to various regions to go and register, only to get there and on the ground, the schedule has been changed. And there are legal issues and we are speaking to our lawyers about that. But beyond that, it creates a lot of inconvenience and uncertainty and people don't know what is going on. The arbitrary change in the schedule by the EC officials in the Upper East region, for instance, has resulted in a court order by the Borgatanga High Court restraining the regional director of the EC from changing the earlier advertised date, advertised date and schedule for registration in the region. And it's important that ordinary citizens who feel inconvenienced by this can proceed to the High Court. Again, the schedule so publicized by the EC is so complicated that many prospective registrants do not understand it. Public education on the schedules is non-existent. This has resulted in people massing up at various registration centers in other constituencies or polling stations instead of waiting for their turn. Again, unlike in the past, where the EC provided directional signs to give visibility to registration centers across the country, this is completely absent this time around. And this is the time that they have the biggest budget, over $140 million to spend. There is also inadequate education on the registration itself. Many Ghanaians think that they already have voter ID cards, hence there is no need to register. We do not blame them for this because we maintain that the decision to compile a new voter register itself was as best imprudent. We are therefore calling on the Electoral Commission to make use of local radio stations, the information vans from the Information Services Department, the National Commission for Civic Education, which has largely been ill-tooled by the Akufuado administration, and community information centers to scale up public education on the cluster registration schedules to address the above situation. We believe that when people are better informed about when registration will be done at their polling stations, they will remain calm for their turn. Three, poor knowledge and appreciation of EC officials about the processes. One of the most disturbing observations we have made is the poor knowledge and understanding being displayed by some registration officials about the entire process. First of all, the EC publicly advertised through a press release dated 26 June 2020 that the registration form 1A is available at their website for registrants to download and complete 
before visiting the polling station. This, we thought, would quicken the registration process. To our utmost dismay, registration officers at some polling stations have rather caused the arrest of prospective registrants for bringing the completed forms to register. Again, as a measure to ensure transparency throughout the registration process, registration officials are required to issue a printout from the registration equipment at the beginning and the end of each day and give copies to party agents present. Unfortunately, this has not been done at some polling stations. Some of the officers claim that they have not been informed about the procedure and this raises questions about the quality of training given to the officials. So for example, all these issues about numbers jumping, one of the ways, I'm saying one of the ways to check is to look at the start of day numbers for a particular day and close of day. So if we get a start of day numbers for today and we get the numbers for close of day for, to, 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 close of day for today, tomorrow morning we will see if the start of day number for tomorrow corresponds with the close of day for today. And that's how you can check whether any inputs are being made on the blind side of people. In the absence of that, definitely there will be speculations. And people would, all kinds of videos are circulating. It is because the EC, some of the staff themselves, are not giving the slips to our polling agents at the various polling um, stations. From our monitoring, we observed that at some polling stations in the Ashanti region, for instance, even security agents were assisting in the completion of registration forms to make the process faster. However, in Adaklu, in the Volta region, for instance, where two registration assistants were assisting in the completion of the registration forms, MPP executives reported the incident to the Volta Regional Minister. I know where the Volta Regional Minister became an official of the EC, and I'll come to that. He was the same person who falsely arrested people and accused them of being Togolese. And we're going to show you pictures and videos of that. Report the incident to the Volta Regional Minister and the Regional Director of the Electoral Commission, who instructed the district officer to stop the second registration assistant from assisting the process. This development is strained and backward, as it will further, and it has, slowed down the registration process leading to longer queues and thereby increasing the risk of COVID-19 infections. So there must be consistency. You can't have a situation where in places like Ashanti region, you can have two other persons assisting. And then in other places, you say that only one person should be filling the form. It just doesn't make sense. So there has to be consistency. Another weird development we observed was that some EC officials asked registrants to queue along party lines at the registration center. Amazing, but it happened. This was the case in the Afajato South constituency. EC officials were then seen directing registrants to queue along party lines, MPP and NDC queues, and we find that most regrettable and unacceptable. We also do know that by law, registered voters can challenge persons they suspect to be ineligible. It is therefore strange that some NDs of supporters who challenged the eligibility of some registrants were arrested by the police and in some cases beaten, and we'll show you evidence of that. Four, non-availability of power to charge equipment. It has also come to our attention that the registration centers on the island communities in Afram Plains North and South, such as, such as uh, Abu Tre, Anriaso, Zion, Kedekofer, Zipo, Fripochieto, Chachapo, in the eastern region, have no electricity. Hence, registration officials do not have sources of power or generators to charge the equipment. In Akatin, in the upper Manyakobro, the machine went off around 3 p.m. on the second day due to unavailability of power to charge the machine. This is seriously affecting the registration exercise in the areas above. The EC must therefore take immediate steps to address these challenges. Now, the situation in Afram Plain is very serious because in some of the communities, you have to travel on the river 
for about 11 hours. So if you travel for 11 hours before you can have access to power, even overnight, how are they going to charge their machines? And in some cases, they send only one machine. So communities and the city MP have to mobilize and rent generators, rent canoes for, for, for the EC officials. And this is unacceptable, where you have a $140 million budget to spend. So they must do the right thing. Five, faulty and slow equipment in some parts of the country. We have observed that while the equipment deployed to places like the Ashanti region from our data and our checks are super efficient, resulting in higher number of registrations, the machines deployed to other parts of the country are generally slow and less efficient, with some breaking down frequently. At Sokwe in our front plains, not for instance, the machine did not work well the whole day on Wednesday, which was the second day of the re registration. As at 5 p.m. on that day, only five, I mean five people, had been registered. There was a similar incident at Aye Suano and Asne Manso across the registration centers, where the equipment couldn't work on the 2nd of July. We also noticed that some technicians are unable to fix the broken down equipment resulting in long delays. This has affected the registration exercise, resulting in the registration of fewer people. In the Etiwa West constituency, the start of the day reports, which I mentioned earlier, at the district office on 3rd July recorded two, instead of 29, at the total number of persons registered the previous day. We are therefore calling on the EC to ensure timely repair of broken down equipment to facilitate the registration process. By the way, they should be honest and tell us when are the rest of the equipment coming? Because it's because the equipment were not ready. That is why when they finished phase one, they were supposed to move to phase two. But then they did, they said batch, batch two of phase one, which is even more confusing. So they are supposed to move to phase two, phase three, phase four. When are the rest of the equipment coming so that we can have the full complement of the registration? It is our money and we need to know. It should be truthful. Six, registration anomalies. We have also observed some anomalies with the registration process. Apart from the errors such as wrong dates of birth and other details of registrants, we have also noticed that some voter ID card numbers were not appearing on the cards, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of them. This was the case in Afat Ato South constituency and many others. As noted already, already, it is here that the EC officials were seen directing registrants to queue along party lines, NDC and MPP queues. Seven, overlapping registration centers, and this is, uh, has been a major issue. We have observed also that some of the registration centers overlap across neighboring constituencies. And there were incidents in Aswase and Lejokuku constituencies where it all ended up in the police station. These were totally unnecessary and avoidable. Eight, registration at Electoral Commission's district offices. The Electoral Commission is required by law to gazette all registration centers. We are therefore surprised about the announcement of the use of the district offices for registration for the aged and persons with disability. While we acknowledge the good intention of the Electoral Commission towards the aged and persons with disability, we think that the EC must operate within the remits of the law to avoid any suspicion. We are reliably informed that the EC's registration at their district offices could serve as VIP registration arrangement for government officials who having exposed Ghanaians to COVID-19 infections through mass registrations are looking to register such that they will not mingle with the general population to increase their risk of contracting COVID-19. Political parties ought to be pre-informed about such arrangements to enable them plan and send agents to the district offices. We, however, see practical challenges with this, with this arrangement. We wonder how the EC is going to place them in their respective polling stations in their communities. 
Because ordinarily, people do not really know the technical names of their polling stations. So he goes, and uh, I am under the mango tree. I am in the middle school. That middle school may have four different polling stations. So if you, you register the people, then there will come the problem where if you have to transfer them onto the register, on election day, they may not find their various polling stations. And it's going to be a major issue on um, voting day. Mobile registration. The intended mobile registration has similar issues at the registration in the EC offices. This arrangement is not governed by any law, and we wonder how people placed in will be how people registered in such a manner will be placed in their respective polling stations. The EC should give us credible explanations. And for all these things that we've raised, we, we are writing to the EC to give us explanations. Because, um, again, the mobile uh, units are not gazetted by any law. It is solely at the discretion of the EC. So they determine where they will move it at any given time. What is the criteria? How do you determine that? And how can our agents be pre-informed so that they know, so that they can monitor the process? It's not clear. So you hear that a mobile unit has moved here. And in every polling station, sometimes we have one person or two people who are focusing on the main registration. So if a mobile unit moves somewhere, the possibility that people, uh, agents will not know is very high. And so there is no transparency in the process. And again, it raises all kinds of legal issues which our lawyers are looking at. Registration in schools. Contrary to the president's directive that there should be no registration in schools, the EC has announced registration in senior high schools. The EC earlier announced that there will be no vote transfer this year. And this is for good reason. In election management, you don't just transfer votes at the last minute. It creates problem. Because of the question of residency, you, you, people must prove that they've lived in a particular area for a very long time, for a minimum of two years. Otherwise, it can lead to gerrymandering, where people can just decide that they will move their votes to particular swing constituencies. And so it's subject to abuse. Now the students are in school, you say you are going to register them, and then you are going to distribute them to constituencies within this very short time. Apart from the data management issues and the potential confusion, it is also prone to abuse, and it can lead to all kinds of challenges. In any case, uh, during the 2019 limited registration, students who registered while in school were assured that their votes would be transferred to their respective polling stations to enable them to exercise their franchise. But this never happened. And we are wondering how it's going to be managed this time. And then, of course, we have an emerging problem of COVID-19 explosion on the campuses. As I'm speaking now, I'm told one of the SHSs in Ashanti region, there's a demonstration going on. And we've stated it clearly. We said we didn't want a new register. And we stated all the reasons, COVID-19, time, everything. They said they won't listen. They want a new register. Any child who dies in any school or contracts the disease is on the head of Nana Kufuado and Jem Mensah because we want them. The intended so registration in school, we have to look at it carefully. Reports of pre existing data in the system of some registrants. For emphasis sake, we want to amplify the point that in some registration centers, Registrants are recording duplicates. This suggests that their data is already in the system. This lends credence to the fact that some old machines have been deployed for the exercise instead of the new machines the EC budgeted for. We are concerned because such innocent people could be disenfranchised and prosecuted for the offense of multiple registration. We are calling on the EC to explain this phenomenon and take steps to rectify it. And I think as citizens whose taxpayer is being used, taxes are being used for this exercise, we want to know how many new machines do they have? How many new machines have they deployed? How many old machines have they refurbished? How many new machines are they expecting? These are legitimate questions that any honest, sincere, transparent electoral commission will, will make available to the public. We need to know, we deserve to know. Then, a very alarming trend, general insecurity at some registration centers. One of the most disturbing developments which is so pervasive is the constant attacks on NDC agents. As reported widely 
in both the print and electronic media. Our agent by name Ebenezer Tete sustained severe injuries on the head after being hit with a concrete block at the registration center at Kaswa by an MPP member. I'm sure you have. There were also gunshots at the same polling station. We have both the video and the pictures, right? Have you seen it? That's Ebenezer Tete. Volume, he spoke. Okay. So when you're ready, it's ready, then you signal me, then I, I'll stop. But I want to hear him speak. Okay. Our youth organizer in Kaswa was also attacked early in the morning of the same day by thugs in military uniform who were on rampage intimidating prospective registrants to prevent them from registering. This raises serious security concerns since it has the potential of preventing people from coming out to register in their numbers. There were also reported gunshots at the Kukutobabi Registration Center where six men on motorbikes discharged weapons. So we say we, we, we have banned vigilantes, we went to sign some paper, and then you see them operating with brazen impunity. They are everywhere. They, they don't even, and, and show, show pictures of the guys who were caught. Some of them were wearing masks. How can these guys who are not regular police or military be wearing masks and coming to the registration centers? To do what? And terrorizing people. And most of them, uh -huh. This um, his name. The details are there. Did you? Uh -huh. This is a uh, uh, mass militia, I believe from believed to be from Oslohusu at the MC. You are the Kakari Provincial Registration Centre this morning in the Abekuma West Constituency. Mass man. And this is a fake um, um, soldier who was arrested, and he confessed that. He was hired by a uh, prospective candidate, a candidate, one of the aspirants, who was hired. This is it. You know, we have the narrative there. We will we'll give them out to you. We call on the police to thoroughly investigate and prosecute the perpetrators of this crime. A known member of the MPP's invisible forces by name Labaran, who lives in Akwetiman, who was also the driver of the MP for Kankwe North constituency. Honorable Ebenezer Saki was spotted in a Ghana Armed Forces uniform, creating chaos. In many parts of the country, the military are all over the place in the company of MMDCs, MPs, or MPP parliamentary candidates. So this is how our military has been reduced to. MPP parliamentary candidates are walking around with soldiers as their bodyguards. In other registration centers, known MPP members are going around attacking people who challenged non-residents who had been bused to register in these constituencies. This was a major source of confusion at Aketebo Registration Center in the upper Menya constituency. The thugs transported in Kia trucks were in the company. Yes? Just be rolling. Let's just be rolling. Were in the company of MPP executives. In a draft, the MC 